love one another? Is it an emotion of the heart? An act of service? A force of the will? Can love ever truly be defined? We think so often in simple terms, but real love goes much deeper. It strengthens the weak, helps those in need, lives in harmony with all people, and holds us accountable. Love means carrying each other's burdens, admonishing and instructing, showing compassion and feeling it too, spurring one another to good deeds, confessing and forgiving, building and maintaining trust, being of one mind no matter our differences. Love means accepting others for who they are and allowing ourselves to be changed in the process. So love holds us together, grafted by faith into the one true Christ, whose example compels us to love one another. As uh, Pastor Doug mentioned, uh, we have just wrapped up uh, our look into justice as a congregation. And as we continue on from here, we are going to continue to look at key characteristics that should define us as the people of God in our world today. And the characteristic that we are now going to turn our attention to is love. If we are going to do justice as individuals, if we are going to do justice as a church, then we need to be known as a people who love others. We need to be known for the love that we show and how we go about showing it to others. Doing justice means that we are going to compassionately act on behalf of those in need. And the links that we are willing to go to as individuals, as a church, to care for others in need, particularly over the long haul, well, it will be driven by the depth of love that we have for those we seek to minister to. We can help people out for a season of life by just giving a little of ourselves. But when we truly care for others out of the love that we have for them, then we will be willing to go farther. We will be willing to do more, to give of ourselves more, to make more sacrifices to meet needs. Love is the heartbeat of compassion. It is the driving force behind our ministries of mercy within the church. It is behind the justice that we seek to do. This morning, if you will turn in your Bibles, we will be in the book of 1 John. And the message that we look at comes from this letter, a letter that is described by many as a letter of love. Other passages in the Bible talk about love, but it is central to what John is communicating here in this particular letter. Over and over again here, John urges his readers to love God and to love one another. In fact, John speaks so much about love in this letter that it led his audience to begin to feel uncomfortable. As they listened to what he was saying, as they took in the depth of what he was getting across. And as we read these same words today, it should make us squirm a little bit as well. But why? Why would the readers in that day feel uncomfortable as John is talking about love? Why would we feel uncomfortable? Well, it's because when we think about what John is saying here, we realize how far we fall short of the perfect standard of love given to us <coughs> in Jesus Christ. And so that his readers in his day didn't become discouraged when they realized they didn't measure up to Christ and his standard of love, Paul gave them these reassuring words in our passage this morning. And when we think of how we don't measure up to Christ, how we don't fully love as he loves, as selflessly as he does, so that we don't get discouraged, we can take these same words to heart today. Follow along in your Bibles, the words will be on the screen. We're going to be reading from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. Beginning in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, 
and murder his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. John begins this section with a very familiar message. He tells his audience to love one another. Jesus himself spoke that simple command decades earlier at the Last Supper, at which John was in attendance. So this tells us that John heard what Jesus said that night. He was paying attention, and this command from Jesus filled John's heart. It filled his heart and his mind, propelling him forward from that time on. This love one another theme became an integral part of John's preaching and teaching over the years. The recipients of 1 John had apparently heard this message, as it says here, from the beginning. That is, they had heard this message to love one another from the beginning of their lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So what then does it mean to love one another? Well, in order to drive home points in his letters, John likes to use contrasts. In his writings, he, he pits truth versus lies, love versus hate, righteousness versus wickedness, obedience versus disobedience, light versus darkness, and the children of God versus the children of the devil. And so when it comes to loving one another, John uses, once again, two contrasting examples here to flesh out what this means for his readers. The first example illustrates the extreme opposite of loving one another, whereas the second example illustrates the ultimate standard of what it means to love one another. And what John is doing is he is putting his audience, his audience back in that day and us today, he's putting us in the middle of those two examples that we are going to look at. And as he puts us in the middle, he is trying to push us to move away from one and move towards the other example. And so let's look at these two contrasting extremes when it comes to loving one another. The first example is one of brotherly hatred rather than a brotherly love. And in order to flesh this out, John goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4 and the account of Cain murdering his brother Abel. In verse 12 of our passage today, John says that Cain was of the evil one. This phrase parallels the phrase of the devil that John uses in 1 John 3, 8. And what John is doing here is he is intentionally setting up Cain as the original example of a child of the devil. He is saying that Cain is the perfect illustration of someone who is of the devil, of the evil one. Cain disobeyed God's commands. He failed to hear God's warnings, and he harbored hatred in his heart and took it to its extreme conclusion, the murder of his brother. The Greek term that John uses here to talk about murder, it's not a word that is just about killing. In fact, it's a word that is, it is much more heavier than that. Its literal translation is to butcher or to slaughter. It's a word that implies brutality, savagery, and hatred on the part of Cain. 
What John wants us to recognize is this, that what happened between Cain and Abel, this wasn't two brothers who just happened to get into a fight, and this fight went a little too far, and one of them got killed. When I was in eighth grade, this may surprise you, but I fought a lot with my sister growing up. My sister was five years older than me. And there was times where we would fight and things went a little bit too far. And perhaps one time I might have thrown her down a flight of stairs. On accident. There's also a possibility that I threw her into a refrigerator and the refrigerator fell on top of her. Oh. My sister's tough, though. She can take <laughs> And we're good friends now, so. This isn't what happened between Cain and Abel. John uses this word here to point out that this wasn't a, a tragic accidental death. Cain's attack on Abel was violent. It was premeditated murder. And why did Cain murder his brother? What was it that stirred up so much hatred? So much anger, so much violence in him. Well, John's answer here is that Cain killed Abel because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Going back to Genesis 4, the story reveals that Cain, the firstborn, was a worker of the ground. While Abel, his younger brother, was a keeper of sheep. So Cain was a farmer. And Abel was a shepherd. Eventually something happened though that provoked Cain to jealousy and rage. Cain brought an offering to God from the fruit of the ground. While Abel brought the very best of his flock to offer as a sacrifice. And it tells us in Genesis 4 verses 4 through 5 that God looked favorably upon Abel's blood offering. But he had no regard for Cain's offering. Why? Why did God consider Abel's offering better than Cain's? Why did he look more favorably upon Abel's offering? There's been several things that have been posited throughout church history to explain this. Some have argued that it had to do with the best of what was brought. Abel brought the very best of his flock. Whereas Cain just brought some of the fruit. From the ground. <coughs> Some have argued that it had nothing to do with the quality of what was brought, but rather that which was brought as an offering. Some have argued that it had to do with Abel's offering of an animal sacrifice, which pleases God as a blood sacrifice, whereas Cain just offered fruits and vegetables. Others have argued that an issue had to do with the manner in which they made their offerings to God. Hebrews 11.4 indicates that Abel offered his better sacrifice in faith. The implication being that Cain did not do so in faith. Somehow Abel recognized that his sacrifice would connect him with God. Whereas Cain did not see that. What we do know for a fact though is that through his actions, Cain revealed a self-centered, disobedient heart. In Genesis 4, we are told that after God looked favorably upon Abel's offering and not Cain's, it tells us that Cain got angry. Cain throws a hissy fit, and he becomes so angry that he doesn't even seek to hide his anger from God. And so God himself confronts Cain with a choice at that pivotal moment in his life. Genesis 4, 7 says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. But instead of listening to God's warning, instead of acting upon God's plea for repentance, Cain allowed the anger in his heart to boil over, leading him to slaughter his brother in the field. John brings all this up because he wants us to understand that Cain was of the evil one. And what John was communicating to his first century readers and what he communicates to us today as well is this. There are many people in the world who are of the evil one. Just like Cain was. And even when these people are confronted with the truth. 
Even when these people are warned, they will continue down the path of wickedness. This is why John warns his original audience and us in 1 John 3, 13. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Because there are many in this world who are of the evil one. John wants his readers to understand the wickedness that stirs within the heart of many in our world. But he also wants us to see ourselves in relation to that wickedness. In verses 14 and 15, John sets up another contrast between those who love the brothers and a person who hates his brother. And what John says here is striking. He says, basically, whoever hates his brother, that is, whoever doesn't love his brother, abides in death. Meaning that they do not truly possess eternal life by grace through faith. Once again, someone who doesn't hate their brother or sister in Christ. Someone who hates another brother and sister in Christ. John says, well... They do not possess eternal life. The person who hates is also a murderer because, as in the case of Cain, murder is the ultimate end of unchecked hatred within our hearts. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Whenever we hate, whenever we insult or are angry with a fellow Christian, we are showing the same heart disease that afflicted Cain. A heart full of hate and anger is a heart of the evil one. So we must ask ourselves, do we hate like Cain? Does our hatred reveal that we don't possess eternal life? That we aren't really in Christ? John's purpose in bringing up the example of brotherly hatred here, it wasn't to cause his readers to doubt their salvation. So that way, if you think of an instance where you may have not liked someone, you've hated someone, well, does that mean I'm not saved anymore? Does that mean I'm not going to heaven? That was not John's intention here. Rather, he was seeking to affirm his reader's salvation by pointing them to a love that now rules over our hearts. Unlike those who hate others and lack salvation, John says to believers here in verse 14, that we know that we have passed from death into life. And how do we know this? Because of our love for one another. In considering Cain's wicked disposition and his murderous actions, John doesn't want us to see ourselves in Cain. On the contrary, those who are not of the evil one but of God are to see themselves as being like someone else. We are to see ourselves in and follow a contrasting example. And the ultimate example of what it means to love one another is to look at Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done through his sacrificial love. Jesus gave his life for us. And just as Christ laid down his life because of his love for us, we should do so for one another. We should be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ enough to the point that you are willing to lay down your life for them? Or do you harbor unchecked bitterness, resentment, and anger for your brothers and sisters in Christ? I think it's fascinating to think did John literally mean that we must lay down our lives for one another? Did he mean for us to search out ways to shed our own blood, to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our brethren? Well, the short answer is yes. 
If the situation ever arose, it would be Christ-like for us to die for the sake of our spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's the extreme. Laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ can involve both big and small sacrifices on our part. And if we're honest with ourselves, it's often those small sacrifices that are the hardest for us to make. Forget laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Often we can't give five minutes for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Forget laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes we can't give five dollars to help our brother and sister in Christ. John himself had something much more practical in mind when he says that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. As verse 17 indicates, to John this meant providing for the material needs of our brothers and sisters. John had in mind believers giving up their time, their money, their wisdom and possessions for the sake of other believers in need. He says here that if we have the world's goods, that is, if we have material blessings in this life, but we fail to use those blessings to help meet the needs of other believers in Christ, well, then he asks, how does God's love abide in us? It's a rhetorical question. For John, the answer is, it doesn't. As John tells us in verse 18, to follow Christ's example, we must love our spiritual siblings. Not simply in the words that we say, but in deed and in truth. Rhetoric devoid of action is just idle talk. We can't just talk about our love for one another. We can't just talk about how much God loves us. We need to live it out. We need to put love into practice. We aren't just to come together once a week and bask in the love of Christ, as great and wonderful as it is. We are to take action in love. To care for and meet the needs of one another. And if you recall, going back to Amos and Micah, no matter how great our worship is, to God it's just noise if we aren't loving one another. God's love for us is our motivation to do justice, to meet needs. And if we aren't doing justice, if we aren't seeking to meet the needs of those within our own congregation, we are not going to be able to meet the needs of those outside of this body. If we aren't loving one another, then what we reveal is that there is a disconnect in our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Like John, I'm not talking about actually physically dying for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ, although that would be God-honoring. I've already had in mind those of you that would be willing to do that for me. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know. Um, what I'm talking about is showing up day in and day out. In inserting ourselves into the lives of our spiritual brethren. I'm talking about getting to know one another to the point that we know what each of our spiritual, emotional, and physical needs are. If being around your church family is a half day a week thing, then I'm going to be blunt. You are going to have an extremely difficult time living out the love of Christ in deed and in truth. And I'm not talking about just being here in this physical location one morning a week. I'm talking about being together. Not only here, but also involved in one another's lives throughout the week. Do you call one another? Do you check in on one another? Do you encourage one another? Do you hang out with other brothers and sisters in Christ in your church body? Do you play with your fellow believers in Christ? That's what is missing in so many congregations today. If you see someone standing off to the side, or if you know of someone who isn't having some of their real needs met, do you seek to show love to them yourself, or do you just expect someone else to do it? And if you aren't having your needs met, 
If you don't feel like you are being shown love by your church family, ask yourself if you are going out of the way to lay down your own life for your brothers and sisters. Perhaps your mother told me, told you what my mother told me. And that is, in order to have friends, Jared, you have to first be a friend. Well, if you aren't feeling loved on and cared for, ask yourself, are you investing your own time and energy getting to know other brothers and sisters in Christ and so that they can get to know you and your needs? We must all ask ourselves if our attitudes look more like Cain or like Jesus Christ. Does our attitude toward our spiritual family resemble more of Cain's hatred for his brother or Christ's love for his bride? And if we are honest with ourselves, I think most of us at one time or another have looked within and we see that we look a lot more like Cain than Jesus. There are people that push our buttons within the body. There are people within our church family who frustrate us. I want you to point at someone right now who frustrates you. No, don't do that. Don't do that. There are people in our church body that if we're honest with ourselves, we harbor bitterness. People that we harbor bitterness towards because we don't feel like they care about us. And we allow that resentment and bitterness to build to the point that we lash out at each other in hurt and in anger. In those instances, we reveal ourselves to be more like Cain than like Jesus. John talks in verse 17 about closing off our hearts toward our brethren. There are times when, once again, if we're honest with ourselves, we close our hearts off towards one another. We often do so when certain needs come up time and time again. We close our hearts to others in the body when those asking for help personally annoy us. We close our hearts off when people don't thank us for helping them. We close off our hearts when we feel like we've done our part and now it's up to someone else to do their part. We close off our hearts to our spiritual brethren when we are focused on and consumed with our own problems. Are there those in the body of Christ that you have closed your heart off from? Because you're tired of them. Because they frustrate you. Because they annoy you. Are there those whom you find ungrateful, harmful, or just plain mean? Are there those that you resent because of their righteous deeds or because of their position within the body of Christ? Are there those that you are upset with? I would implore you to take God's warning to Cain to heart this day. Genesis 4, 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. If you are angry or upset with a brother or sister in Christ, my encouragement to you this day is, be careful. Sin is crouching at the door of your heart, and you must take steps to rule over it, making sure that it doesn't consume you. Repent. Forgive. Reconcile. While we all look a little more like Cain than at Christ at times, there are also other instances when we know that the Spirit's working in us because the Spirit gives us a love for someone that we didn't know we had within us. When brothers and sisters in Christ challenge our devotion to them, when they hurt us deeply, there are times when we demonstrate a love for them that we didn't know we had. And that's because it's not a love born of us, it's born of Jesus Christ within us. There are times when I personally didn't know how I could possibly love another believer in my own wisdom and strength, and God has had to remind me, I can, but Christ in me can. Sometimes we hate like Cain. Other times we love like Christ. Most of the Christian life, though, is lived in between those examples. And it's in that in-between that we need to continually examine our own hearts and take an honest assessment of ourselves of who we look more like and of who we want to look more like. 
Are we content being bitter and resentful like Cain? Or do we want to love like Jesus Christ? Whoever we decide to be like as individuals or as a church is whom we will reflect to the lost. So will we reveal ourselves to be of the evil one or of our just, loving, and merciful God? If I were to ask you as a congregation this morning, and I have a feeling if I were to ask any evangelical body of Christians on a Sunday morning, I would get the same response. Do you want to be a loving church or a hateful church? And almost every church is going to say, we want to be a loving congregation pastor. We'll talk is cheap. Are we willing to live that out? Are we willing to show that love to the people who are in need? Are we willing to take steps to do justice and to love others in the midst of their needs? Well, in order to do so, we must begin by loving one another. So I ask you today, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love the person sitting next to you? Do you love the person in front of you or behind you? Do you know them well enough that you could show them love? Are you harboring something within your heart that is keeping you from loving anyone within this body of Christ? Let us take that to God this day. Let us surrender that to him and may we seek to love one another and forgive one another as he has done so with us. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you and we confess that in and of ourselves, we look a lot more like Cain. We harbor resentful feelings and emotions when our brothers and sisters in Christ hurt us. We hold on to grudges and we lash out in anger and frustration. But Father, through your Son, you have shown us a different, a better example of what it looks like to love unconditionally. A love that goes beyond the, the hurts that we might experience, the pain that we go through. A love that remains true through all circumstances, through all situations. Father, my prayer today is that you would help us to look within our own hearts today. What is it that is keeping us from forgiving, from moving forward, from reconciling? What is it that is keeping us from sacrificially laying our own lives on the line for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ? Father, forgive us for not even being willing to, to sacrifice the little things. The time that we have, the energy that we have, the money that we have, the many blessings that you have given us. Forgive us for hanging on to those so tightly that we aren't willing to give them all up for the sake of those that we are called to love. Father, continue to change our hearts. Continue to help us to love like your son, Jesus Christ. And we'll look to you and your word. And we'll trust that your spirit will continually shape us and form us and help us to do that in the days ahead. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.